Welcome back, everybody. My hobby since it opened in 2003. In fact, I've known Dave since uh, we were teenagers, and he worked part time in, a, in another local hobby shop way back in the 70s. And and certainly one of the things that I really enjoy about Hornet Hobbies is that when I come here, it's it's not only a store, but it's almost like a modeling clinic. And I've learned so much, and my models have improved so greatly uh, because of that experience. And and Dave, I'm you know I'm interested. Can can you tell everyone how how that all began? Well, it began. Um Probably in the early 80s, John, the uh, OMSS uh, figurine show uh, was at Castle Loma. And um, it was, it's a fantastic uh, group of guys, a club that I think began in the early 60s. And they were holding uh, their annual show. And a, there was a series of shadow boxes there. And I, I rode there on my bike, and there's these shadow boxes there. And I, I never knew what a shadow box was. And uh, so you get chatting to the guys, and uh, they pointed to the direction of this guy who built all the shadow boxes, and it was Chapin. So we struck up a small conversation, and and it just led from that. And then um, Chapin and myself over the years, because he ran an annual show in Chicago um, every October, right, at right. roughly at the same time as the Castle Loma shows, and so we just sort of became friends, just through the hobby and so when Hornet Hobbies opened in 2003 um, because of our relationship with Shep um, or my relationship it, it was just one of those things that I, I said Shep I hold clinics at the hobby shop would there ever be a possibility where you'd like to come up and meet the guys and, and, and you know do a clinic and of course he agreed to that in, in 2004 a year later and it's still to this day um, the most traffic I've ever had at the, at the hobby shop. And his clinic actually had 77 people at it. So um, th through Shep, but then, uh, of course, you get to meet other people. And, of course, I met Bill Horan through Shep Payne. And then I just, all you have to do is ask, right? So a year later or two years later, I asked Bill Horan, right. would you like to come up to Hornet Hobbies? and? Right. Put on a series of clinics. Right. Yeah, I, I remember those, and and um, and I, I also remember that um, there, there seemed like there was a lull between between uh, Bill Haran and, and and bringing others in, and, and it sort of corresponded to the experience that I was having as a modeler. As you know, Dave, I I'd always been an aircraft guy, and uh, you know I had built tanks, of course, but uh, to, you know to be honest, when I got back into the hobby in the early '90s, tanks to me were kind of boring because they were all of drab or they were dark gray, and there really wasn't a a whole lot of interest in them, and then, of course, uh, uh, you know, a revolution sort of started with uh, with guys like um, uh, Meg and and um, Adam Wilder, and, and and of course Mike Rinaldi, and so on. And how how did, how did that all all come about? Well, uh, you know, it was uh, it was probably a cold winter afternoon here at Horner Hobbies, and snow piling up outside. Trish was flipping through one of the Trish's the uh, administration person that works here, and um, Trish was flipping through one of the Molly magazines, saw a little ad for a, a new book coming out, Tank Art One, and but she was like blown away because she, uh, she see it's Saturday mornings here at the shop, as you know, John. Yes. There's yes. quite a group of guys that come, and so Trish the following Saturday was showing the guys just a little interest in this book, and by that afternoon, that Saturday afternoon, Trish was saying, Dave, you gotta you gotta phone this guy. You gotta find out a way to get a hold of him through um, Rinaldi Studios. So she quickly just emailed Mike Rinaldi and basically said what I'd asked Shep and Bill Horan in the previously, you know? Right, right. Would you like to come up and do some clinics? Right. And I think, uh, like, Mike Rinaldi was, um, I thought, what a great idea, but he'd never done it before either, right. you know? So we, Trish started, you know, just pulling the strings and doing what she does right right well, I, I know it's it's a uh, you know a lot of times uh, uh, one of the one of the challenges we have is that there's no shortage of, of uh, interesting products and techniques that are available and and sometimes finding a starting point to, to what products and and what techniques is, is the hardest thing that you have to overcome and so certainly having someone like like Mike Rinaldi uh, come in and, and explain you know how to use pigments how to use oil paints uh, you know the, the hair, the hairspray technique, and so on. Th those kinds of things are are so important because then Trish is able to take that and and make sure that you know the right products are available. 
And, you know, even things like, um, um, you know, I'm always breaking parts on my airbrushes just because, you know, that's the way it goes. And, you know, it doesn't matter the, the type of part that I need, you know, for an Iwata, she's always able to source it for me. And that's, uh, that, that's so critical because, uh, of course, when, when you get in the groove with a model, you know, you don't want to get slowed down because you're waiting for something. No, that's true. And, and you know, having someone like Trish who's, uh, who's really on top of what's going on in the hobby and, and has all the right connections to make sure that she can get the right product when you need it. Yeah, she's always searching and she's like a little Sherlock Holmes, you know, and, and there's no stone unturned when it comes to her trying to find something, right. you know. She always does her best trying to find something. So um, as soon as the contacts were made, you know, through Trish with Mike, um, everything sort of came into order and presto and, and Mike Rinaldi's been here three times now. Wow. Yeah. So, well, I've, I've, I've attended every one of them and, uh, um, you know, with all due modesty, what we have in front of us, uh, one, one of the results of, of, of the, the various courses that I've taken. And um, so it's interesting because, uh, as I was saying, I'm, I'm not a, I wasn't an armor guy per se, I was more interested in aircraft. And it's a result of, of the techniques and so on that, that people like Mike Rinaldi introduced that got me interested in doing armor because I wanted to see if I could take those techniques and actually use them on aircraft. The thing about a technique, of course, is you have to, you have to try it first. You have to understand how to work it before right. you can actually apply it to something different. And to sit there and watch Mike do it absolutely is a little different. A absolutely. As good as tank art books are. And absolutely. They, and they're Absolutely. Terrific books. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. There's, there's, to sit here and watch them do it. Absolutely. There's, there's, no, there's no substitution for the actual experience of seeing someone use the product. And, and, and especially with Mike, you know, not only explaining um, uh, the how, but also the why you would use a specific product for a specific application. And so if, if I look at the results of, of this experience, um, uh, so this, this is the fourth model, armor model, that I built. And, and it's absolutely the result of the, of the clinics and so on that, that have gone on here and the, the things that I've been able to learn. And well, it's, it, it's led to the cover of this book. <laughs> and um, you see, uh, about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, Shep had come to me knowing that obviously I, I had the hobby shop and I'd gone to the AMP shows and I'd gone to these different shows he knew that I knew the the guys out there, Andy Golden and, and John Rosengrant, um, Greg Jalar. Um, but Shep didn't necessarily know these guys visually. You know, they he knew Andy and Greg through being at the Chicago show and they lived in that neighborhood. So but he wanted to know the absolute top of the line guys. Um, and again, all these guys probably have been to a Rinaldi clinic seen his stuff or, or a Shep clinic. And so Shep asked me just to basically, you know, put a list of guys together and then Shep through photographs or what have you would then do the final choosing as That's to right. who's going to be in his book. That's right. Yeah. So I, I was effectively auditioned. I, I submitted some photographs and uh, I think the, the, there's two great days in my modeling career. One, one of them was when, when Shep said that he wanted to be in the book. And then the next one was when I was on the cover. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, and, yeah. and it's you know the long and the short of it is, John. Yes, it's Rinaldi and it's Megan, it's Adam Wilder coming to the Hornet Hobbies to show these techniques. But you're damn well, baby. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, you yeah. still have to apply. You yes. have to go home. That's right. Some of the guys who take these clinics probably go home and then start their regular day again. Some other guys leave a Mike Rinaldi clinic. And get on their workbench within a half an hour and start, you know, testing out what they just learned. Right. Right. And, you know, and that's the way to do these things. Right. Right. The, other, the other thing, just to talk about the Chicago show or, or IPMS Nationals or whatever, everybody should just clean off their workbench a couple of days before they go to these shows. Because the, it doesn't matter about the gold, silver, and bronzes at these shows. It's if you get any enthusiasm from somebody's model. If Mike Rinaldi's models at a at a hobby show, or John Mahars or Shep Payne's, you're gonna want to get home that Sunday night and get on the modeling table. So don't have it all cluttered, guys. Don't have it all <laughs> sparkle it up before you leave because you don't want to come home to all that stuff. So, hey guys, it's it's hobby time. It's, and I'd like to welcome Mike Rinaldi. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Mm -hmm. Traveling. All the way from Portland to join us here 
um, at the hobby shop. Uh, Mike's been here in the past, and we've always had a great time, you know, putting on a series of cleaning. I'm sort of a slave driver when Mike comes because he, <laughs> over the course of uh, in three or four days, he's probably got to do about nine clinics. So, but um, anyway, it's great to see you again, Mike. Mm -hmm. Glad, Same here. glad everything is well. Yeah. And then um, what I'd like to do is um, just bring John back. Um, John Mahar, then John Mahar and uh, Mike are going to sit here and chat about their their Pershings. So, thanks very much for joining us and I'll bring John in. Well, Mike, I, uh, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, the work that you did on a, on a Pershing. Um, I remember when this, uh, when this, when I first saw this, it was part of Tank Arc 2 uh, back in 2013. And uh, I guess one of the things that uh, really got my attention was that uh, uh, it was it was a, a one color tank, a monochromatic tank, and the fact that you, you were able to make it so interesting uh, just just was was fascinating. And then and then of course when you actually came to Toronto as part of the promotion for that that book, mm -hmm. and you brought it with you, uh, that was just uh, it, it was so inspiring uh, because thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, you know American tanks to me had always been kind of dull, frankly. Sure. And, uh, That's a and, common comment. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't know, maybe you could talk about some of the things that, uh, that you've done to, to bring it alive so well. Yeah, well this was the, the to me a 48th kit. Obviously it's a lot smaller than the 35th version. And um, the Pershing itself is a, is, is, a, is a tougher looking vehicle than the Sherman's in, in the most uh, basic of conversations of tank design. And I've always liked the Pershing, a lot of guys do. And when this kit came out, um, when to me introduced this kit, um, I kind of felt it would be a fun transition from a lot of the 35th scale work that I had done um, and to, to John's point of, of taking a monochromatic paint scheme and working with it in the way that I do and so uh, it was featured in Tank Art 2 that I had done at the time and I really felt it was, it was an interesting way to play with all of draft paint, uh, working the dust and the working the stowage and then kind of giving the tank kind of a sportier, more interesting visual look uh, that the Persian can capture. So and it was something that I think a lot of guys gravitated towards when I done. Um, just some subtle filters and some um, my oil paint rendering that I like to do and um, there's not a lot of chipping on this one so this one has a different feel to the German armor um, and then of course with the stowage and, and how the allied stuff always geared stuff up um, and then you know popping the ID panel in the back to give a little splash of color just you know it's an eye-catching piece and right. I think a lot of guys just in the sense that it was monochromatic but there's there's right. visual storytelling going on right and, and to that point, you know, one of the things that I, I really enjoy about Mike's book is that, that he, you know, he talks a lot about the, the art of storytelling. And, and I would look at that model and, and I can imagine uh, making the run for Ray Morgan um, and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, trying to get across that bridge and, sure. and, and get up to the other side and, and mm -hmm. trying to end the war quickly. It just captured that, that feel um, so very well. And, and the other thing that, uh, that I enjoyed about, about this tank, um, as well as uh, all the other ones you've ever done, is, is the fact that you spend so much time talking about not only the, the you know the, the how of, mm -hmm. of a particular technique sure. but but the why of a yeah. technique and and that's been really valuable to me as a as a as a modeler mm -hmm. because um, th there are so many techniques out there there are so many products out there yeah and it's really a matter of there are. There's yeah a lot. It, there's, there's a lot. it's really a matter of trying to to uh, equip yourself with a quiver full of, of mm -hmm. the various techniques and, and you know, pull out the, the right arrow to, yes. to, to, to accomplish the right result. And, and knowing why you're doing that. That's right. And understanding the point of for That's modeling right. in particular, of why that, to use your term, the arrow or the tool is, is what you're trying to do with it. And so that definitely is something that I've, I've focused on as a publisher, uh, as an author, but as my own model building too, is my point is to educate you guys. Right. So that you guys can elevate your own right. models to new heights and new levels. And so if this is a follow on to your previous work, I like to see there's improvements and there's better technique going on and, and better storytelling at the end right. of the day. And that's right. what it's about for me. So. Right, right. And so, so I guess with that, I, you know, one of the things that I've, I've striven to do with, with my take on the, on the Pershing is, is frankly copy a lot of the things sure. that, that Mike, uh, Mike did. Now, um, it, you know, Mike had the advantage that uh, at the time that he, that he did the model, there was actually a, a resin set available storage set yeah. specific to the kit yeah fit the kit all the way around yeah. right right mm -hmm. and and certainly uh you know one of the things that's maybe sometimes challenging about model building is of course is you, you sometimes take on a, a pretty big bite in terms of what, what you're trying to accomplish sure. a, anything you can use to 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 get mm -hmm. to the end result quicker yeah. is a good thing and that's that's another thing i like Absolutely. about Hornet hobbies here is that uh there's always um options in terms of uh you know getting to that finish line as quickly as possible that being said, so when I when I started my project, there, there really at that time there was no uh, specific detail set uh, 
uh, for stowage for the for the thirty fifth scale right. Pershing. And so what I had to do was I had to I had to do my own stowage. And, and frankly, I, I, I looked at, at Mike's model, and I and I kind of copied some of the things that that, that you're doing. Um, uh, but I had to I had to do it in such a way that um, um, there, there's a saying in, in, in the aircraft modeling world, uh, you know, build them strong. Yeah. So when you're adding a, a detail part to a model, you, you want to kind of think about how you're actually going to yeah. attach it to the model. Sure. And so one of the things I've, I've done, Mike, I've, for example, um, you know, similar to your model, you know, you, you had the, you know, the jerry can strapped to the, mm -hmm. the tracks. I always like that, that look. Right. And so I wanted to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so what I, what I ended up... It is a working hobby shop, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that I, that I did was, I, I, so this, this jerry can, of course, is, is mounted to the tracks. Mm -hmm. yeah, and what I did was to make sure that it's, it's going to work properly is it's actually pinned. I like that idea. That's a, that's a clever idea. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it makes it nice and sturdy, so that when when it comes time to actually mm -hmm. paint it, yeah. and, and mount it, it's it's going to be a lot easier to do yeah. that. That's a great idea. And and so what I'm going to do is I'll just take some lead foil and I'll just run it through the handles of the right. jerry can Put a strap and, in on and, and back around the, the tracks, mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden you've sure. got you've got some storage that's uh, mm -hmm. that's that's properly uh, mm -hmm. hanging on the tank. Really, you've done a great job with the dust and some of the some of the wear and tear up here, and the, the different patinas that you've achieved so far is looking really good. Well, thank you. And, yeah. and I also took your idea for the little splash of color. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this case, I um, I'm, I'm actually modeling a, a marine Pershing in, right. in Korea. I can see that by the helmet. There. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up on that. Very nice. Well, it says USMC too. That too. That's a giveaway. It's a dead giveaway. So what the, the splash of color I have is this blue blanket, mm -hmm. and I, I just figured that I know that uh, these tanks were That's transport. folded tidy for a marine blanket, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Most marines I know, they don't even know how to fold anything, so I'm just kidding. So I, I wanted to uh, you know, suggest that this might have been part of the Inchon okay. operation, because of course the, the tanks, were they were they were they had to be transported to, to the landing, and maybe they grabbed a, a navy blanket along the way. Sure. Great idea. Uh, there you got your splash of color. Absolutely. Yeah, so and a little bit of storytelling, which is which it, is what this is about. Exactly. So. And, and one of the other things that I did was, you know, again, to capture some inches, you know, I, mm -hmm. I made the, the jerry can a water can, so I was able to put the, the white X in it. Yeah. I was able to put the, the, the medical bag. The and, medical bag. Mm -hmm, sure. And then on the, on the tank itself, mm -hmm. uh, the K ration box. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of the things I also did was... There's um, a little boot back here. I don't know if you guys can... There's a little there's a little boot back at the back of the thing there that he's put into that and, and that that's actually there for a specific reason the the strap that I that I pulled in the, the K ration box on mm -hmm. that goes around one of the lifting rings mm -hmm. and because the box is pinned I, I couldn't figure out how to drag the strap oh, all for the sure way. for sure so yeah. I wanted to cut off the angle that the, the viewer can see the, uh, so that came very clever the, the there you go yeah. nicely done yeah. smart clever let's end it there <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like to, to do is I always review myself. I review my own work and, and oftentimes when guys are this kind to me and they, and they talk about a, a piece that I've done, and this is 2013. Um, you know, a lot has changed in my particular modeling, modeling world and I haven't seen this model because it's been in the Hornet Hobby display case uh, in a few years now. So looking at it and looking back at this, you know, first off, it's a, you know, a memory lane for me. Um, there's a lot of things in 48th scale that are done uh, that kind of alter my way of, of really working in 35th scale, which is my primary scale. Um, but one of the things when I look at this as we're talking back and forth and looking at John's work and, and, and kind of looking around this one is that this to me is, um, even though it's a little bit dusty just from being on display a little bit, is that there's a lot of new ideas that I can do to this. There's a lot of things I could really uh, play around with and, and I could even continue to work on this model. And I like it to be something that a lot of guys should think about is that when you think it's finished and you kind of advance along a couple years down the road, don't be afraid to come back in with a little oil paint or a little bit of pigments or a little bit of something uh, and, and pop a model up to another level that you've already kind of completed, especially if you still have it in your display case or whatever. And I think it's something um, because there is, there is kind of a transition that happens in here. And there's, there's some things in here that I would, I would like to do different now that I see this. And I have, you know, if I had this on my workbench, I can come in with the brush and I can do some things. And that's, um, that's not against the rules. There's nobody says you can or cannot do it. Now, I wouldn't do that and then go re-enter it in a competition of that nature, but just for my own personal sake, um, keep that in mind, guys, because it's something you can really right. um, really take advantage of as your skill sets improve, as your techniques improve, and as we get new products, because there's always new products to play with and stuff like that. So sometimes there's, with all of Drab, I could really come in here and do some more, more interesting things to kind of pop this model up even a little bit more. 
looking at John's work right now, um, John's asked me to critique it, and that's something I'm always happy to do. A lot of guys like to know my opinions of what they're working on and how they're doing and how they're moving forward and everything. And um, The general sense of this model, it's got a lot of visual interest for, for an olive drab piece. It's got a lot of darks and lights and good contrast going on, and he's developing the story through the stowage and how he's cut the fenders off and everything like that because these were, you know, when they get used in the combat and the, the vehicles get beat up, that's a great thing. Um, but on a critique level, trying to point out some things he can improve on, like a lot of us, you know, we all have, I've just mentioned, I'd like to improve my own work because I'm just not happy with it anymore. So I look at this and, uh, you know, some of the chipping and chipping is a, a big topic for everybody. You know, Allied vehicles were primed and painted slightly different than some of the World War II pieces some of us like to build. But there's probably a little bit too much chipping on this for, for what I think would probably be a realistic piece. Um, and then some of it's also not quite natural enough for my take. So I think there's something as a modeler to improve is working on kind of the organic, natural flow of, of weathering and chipping and, and pain effects. And that's probably where John's probably going to develop the most over the next uh, few projects with this. But, um, you know, the rusting of the exhaust is beautifully handled. It's got a really nice texture to it um, without overdoing it. And the tow cable looks like a, a piece of steel wrapped around like it should versus a rope or something loose. And, and there's, so there's a lot of good things about this. But at the same time, too, there's there's also a little bit of room for improvement every little bit. Please, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, please. So, Thank you. Um, and I think John's done a wonderful job to kind of move himself forward in the next level. There you go. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things with when, when kind of looking at uh, new, newer ways to do things in the painting world and weathering world is John in particular really likes to color modulate, which is a newer type of painting style where you, you use lights and darks of a color range to kind of add more visual interest into a model. And oftentimes when, when I say stuff like, I think your chipping needs a little bit of improvement and stuff like that, well, there's other newer techniques that can really be employed, and such as the hairspray chipping technique uh, that I've talked quite a bit about in the books and the publications and stuff. And a lot of other guys are using it. And I find the reason is because the chipping itself will come out a little bit more natural, a little bit more organic, and a little bit in a superior way. But the question often gets asked to me is like, well, what about color modulation? Because you put a lot of paint down. Right. And it's, it's the success of layers are such that uh, it's days yes. as, as you're applying it. And, yes. and the hairspray mm -hmm. typically It's multiple is, sessions. Yes, and, that's mm -hmm. right. And, and the hairspray, of course, is, is the couple of times I've tried it, 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 you know, as time goes on, it becomes less and yes. less yes. active. For sure. For sure. And so what I, I've kind of uh, brought in as, uh, another piece here is uh, it's, a, it's a Gundam leg, but it's, it's color modulated. Um, but it's also hairspray chipped. And so you can see that what I've done is by controlling the paint opacity, uh, becoming a little bit um, more refined in the airbrushing stages, uh, you can still allow yourself all the little chipping and marks and scratches that happen through the hairspray chipping that really um, provide that kind of really interest uh, in a natural, organic, a realistic manner for, for paint chips. Uh, is still applicable and basically what, what would happen here in an olive drab setting would be you're just going to kind of kick back a little bit the amount of paint that you're putting down and there's some other newer products out there too that in the painting conversation allows us to do this now and so you can still employ all these kind of techniques with the color modulation with the oils with the enamels all of this is an integrated system and, and something that's just where realistically if i was advising someone probably step back practice on a different model, see what you can achieve with it first, and then move forward onto your actual real model. Okay, yep. That's a great idea. And I think the next time too, if when you if you continue with a with a single color paint scheme where you want to employ that stuff, right. color modulate it out three or four shades of that base color, work on the airbrushing part of it a little bit, but you're gonna leave even a little bit less color around the areas where it's gonna chip naturally. I see. So you're gonna premeditate your painting process a little bit. Okay. So like for example on here, I much uh, there's much less paint around where I know I'm probably going to chip um, more I extremely, I so to speak. I see. And so I kind of control, even though I've got my color modulation in here right. uh, and all that other kind of stuff. And so that's basically how you would address that situation. Yep. Very good. Okay. Thank you gave me yeah. some ideas. Thank you Great. For, uh, for participating in this uh, ongoing series that's put on here at Honored Hobbies. And, and I, I want to just say that uh, this, this session that I just had with you, Mike, this is, this is what happens all the time here. Um, one of the reasons why that I continue to come to this store is that uh, you know every Saturday is like a modeling clinic, and uh, that being said, it's you know it's too bad, Mike, you live so far away, but yeah. but thank you very much for making the trip, and we're you know I'm looking pleasure. forward to looking forward to seeing you. My again. pleasure to come here and hang out with you guys. All right, this is fun. fun. The Canadians are great. It's great, great generosity, 
great hosting and great modeling. Oh, thank you. Thank you very and much. And some good hockey. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get better. Yes. <laughs> you will. You always have. And that's, right. that's one thing I like to look for is everybody always looking to strive to be a little bit better with their words. Excellent. Thank, thank you very you much, Mike. Thank you, guys.